Welcome, everybody, to the Disability Digest Wednesday live event. We have a special event uh, today with attorney James Mitchell Brown is back with us again. Thanks for joining us. And um, today we're going to talk about um, some key aspects of getting your social security disability benefits approved. And I see many of you are already including your questions um, in the chat there, which we encourage you to do. We'll take as many as we can at the end. So if you're watching this out on Facebook, you should have access to a chat and definitely on YouTube. Uh, so you can enter your questions uh, in there today. But before we get started, if you don't know um, attorney James Mitchell Brown, I, I would definitely refer to you as the industry icon um, for social security disability. You've been doing this work since 1973, uh, which is impressive. And you've testified in front of Congress, you've been on CBS News, and many of you, if you're out there watching this um, and have been subject to an overpayment situation or a continuing disability review, um, Attorney Brown has helped us put together informational segments, courses that have likely, hopefully helped you keep your benefits. So um, welcome, welcome. Glad to have you here, Jim. Appreciate it. Glad to be back. Brian, before we get started on today's topic, I do want to make a comment. We talked about overpayments last time. Yes. And I've had a lot of calls from people who didn't take them seriously because they said, it's the government's fault they overpaid me. Why should I have to pay them back? Take it seriously. I'm getting calls from people who have had this going on for two or three years. And by then, it's often too late to challenge it. If you get that overpayment, respond quickly. Don't ignore it because then you're really having a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. Take that letter seriously. Don't ignore it. Don't think because it's their fault, you're off the hook. If they underpaid you, you'd want them to pay, pay you the difference. If they've overpaid you, they're going to want the difference back unless you can meet their rules for not paying it back. So take action. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, good tip. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so for today, I'm excited to get into this. I mean, getting disability benefits approved historically has been challenging, but there's a, many that could argue in today's environment, it's one of the most difficult. And you're going to go through some of the top tips that you've learned probably from your experience over the years. Um to help people um, get their benefits approved. And listen, just in advance, I want to thank you for doing this. I mean, here at the Disability Digest, our whole philosophy is we give everything away and we teach people how to get their benefits and keep them. Um, and if they want to have help or partner with us, then that's a conversation we can have. And you're one of the few people that is willing to come in here with the same mindset to just basically give away everything, you know, so thank you on behalf of everybody. All right. There. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So can we get at it? Are you ready? I'm ready. But along that line, you should know that when I started, 8% of the people got lawyers on their social security claims. It's become so difficult. And in the eighties, they changed the system so much that now it's almost 90% have representatives. Yeah. It, Easy cases shouldn't have to be represented, but it's difficult. And maybe we can provide some tips to help people today. Amen to that. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's start with uh, a common topic for somebody that is uh, starting the process. They're out of work. They're injured. Like w people, people that are applying like right out of work, like 30, 60 days there's like a trend of those that are getting denied. Um, what can you share with us and the listeners out there? What, what are some of the reasons for those denials? And, and uh, so hopefully people can avoid it. Well, 
you have to prove that you're going to be unable to work for 12 or more consecutive months. Mm -hmm. If you apply right after you've stopped working, it's difficult for the people making those decisions to say, will this person be off work for 12 months? They've had a work history of 10, 20, 30 years. How do I know they'll be off work 12 consecutive months? The people making the decisions are evaluated based on the quantity of work they do, not necessarily the quality of their work. Every one of them has had a case that they've paid, and then the person went back to work before the 12 months was up, and they look bad for doing that. Why didn't you know they were going to return to work? Mm -hmm. If you wait until you're off work, let me disconnect that. Sorry about that. You're you're a popular guy, I understand. Um, um, you disconnect the phone and forgot today. And now it's not disconnecting. There we go. That should have done it. Okay. Oh, that was even Social Security calling me. Um, <laughs> they probably know you're doing this. They're calling yeah, you. Yeah, they're probably <laughs> complaining about the tips I'm giving. <laughs> In any event, wait until you're off work four to four and a half months. That way, the person who's making the decision is going to review it at the seven and a half, eight month mark. And it's more likely they can accept that you'll be off work 12 months. Yeah. If you don't, if you, if you wait a while to sign up, your chances are better to win. The second thing is at that point, you can start gathering medical evidence too. Mm -hmm. If I've had, I had a case a couple of years ago where my client had myothenius gravis, Graves' disease, and lupus. She was turned down. And I looked at the reason, and they didn't get her hospital records. Mm -hmm. She'd been in the hospital nine times in the 12 months prior. I got her 16,000 pages of hospital records, filed them with my appeal, and a week later, they approved her claim. Beautiful. Um, the person, the, the head of the, the, the disability determination, the state agency, said it was a new claims rep who didn't know she could have gotten an extension waiting for those. Most of them don't want to get extensions because they still look bad. Mm -hmm. um, this time, she was lucky that I knew to get the records before I filed the appeal. Had I just filed the appeal, they would have turned her down quickly because the second step is difficult. If you can get your medical records together quickly, that helps a lot. Mm -hmm. Jim, I have a question. B back to the applying at the four or five month mark. Are there any outliers to this, like a stroke victim that's not going to get any recovery or, uh, you know, aggressive cancer? Is there any exception to this? Aggressive cancer is something you can apply immediately. A stroke victim is a difficult one. Some people who've had strokes recover well. Some people don't. The mm -hmm. potential claimant should say to their physician, how long is my recovery going to be? If I'm paralyzed on one side, how long will I be paralyzed? Yeah. The doctor says you'll never recover. You can file sooner. If the yeah. doctor says it's too early to tell, you mm -hmm. have to wait. Mm -hmm. I had somebody turned down who'd had a stroke at birth, was completely paralyzed on one side. And when she filed for disability, they still denied her yeah. as an adult. So you just can't tell. And it, it's partly what the doctors are going to say. One of the difficult things is some doctors feel they're a failure if they deny you. Or I mean, if they help you. Some mm -hmm. doctors feel if you're applying for disability, they failed. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to tell the doctors you're helping your patient. Mm -hmm. Not saying they'll never work again. It's saying they can't work for 12 months. Mm -hmm. Doc, you're trying to help this patient. Mm -hmm. Let's help them get their money while they can't work and get them back to work. Yeah. Half of the clients actually return to work. Yeah. So for those of you listening out there, just to tighten up this piece right here, uh, uh, filing at the four to five month mark is what Jim is recommending. There's a media piece that I put out about a month ago that showed social security statistics 
of 17% for those that are filing um, within that five month period. So it's, I guess it shows that some are getting approved, but that's low compared to, I mean, the national average that I see for just general generic national average at initial is like 36%. Are you seeing it like it's so, so you have a pretty good bump there if you can just follow the message and wait and let, unless you have any other numbers to share with me on that. Right. It's 36%, but it's over 40% of people who wait it. Yeah. So it, it's a bigger number. It gives you your better chance. And if you're denied, you're almost sure to get denied the second time. And mm-hmm. then you have the wait, depending on where you are, of six months to two and a half years until you get a hearing at the third step. Right. That extra right. month or two in the beginning can save you six to 24 months to get a final decision. Yeah. That's a, re- that's a super valuable point. You know, if you're in Texas and Florida, you're in for a long haul. Um, right. So, so that's good. Um, Jim, I'm noticing in your office, you've got some beautiful art behind you, that picture of a pool table and that. So I want to talk about uh, the artist in you for a minute, right? Um, When when I file a claim, I think of myself as an artist. My wife is an artist, but a different kind. Uh, She took a class on business for for artists, and they said the most creative people in the world are lawyers. (laughs) <laughs> there was a big groan, I'm sure, in the room of artists. But I, when I file a claim, I think of myself as an artist. And I'm painting a picture of my client from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet. Too many people are denied because they put down on their reason for their applying, applying the last thing that happened. I had a heart attack, so I can't work. But they forget to mention that they have high blood pressure, that they have arthritis, they've had two back surgeries, a shoulder surgery. That's the artist in me. I will go through my client from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet Mm -hmm. and include everything I possibly can about them. That makes it more helpful in showing the person making the decision why this person can't work. Mm -hmm. Uh, Years ago, I won a case And I was doing this for my client who had multiple problems. And when I was doing my head to toe, he said, well, I injured my shoulder, both shoulders in high school, and I can't lift my arms more than parallel to the ground. But I've worked 35 years that way. That condition didn't disable him. But the restrictions, because that meant he couldn't do any jobs reaching overhead, he was limited reaching forward. That put us over the top and got him his disability. So everything counts. Things that you've been doing for years that you've compensated for still can contribute to your disability. Paint a picture of yourself. So Jim, if does something to be considered in this, does it need to be diagnosed like the shoulder injury that was a physical injury are there other instances where something might be applicable but it's not diagnosed well you're getting into also what i like to think of as a future diagnosis there's one psychologist i know who said anybody who's been working and then has to stop because of an injury or disease is going to have depression anxiety it's normal. Doctors mm-hmm. taking care mm-hmm. of your physical body, forget the mental part. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I recommend, I, I talk to my clients about it, but I find that people who are off work because of a physical problem have emotional overlays. I recommend that they see a psychologist. Three to five visits with a psychologist does wonders, one for their own being. A disability is sort of like the grieving process where there's stages to go through. Mm -hmm. And I can talk about those stages. I'm not the one to help somebody get through them. But you get those steps. You've added the mental component to your claim. But also people at Social Security might be thinking, 
this person's 46 years old, they've had back surgery, they say it didn't work and they still have a lot of pain, but how bad can their back really be? We only wish they had one day of feeling how bad that, bad that back really is. But if you have a therapist who says everything you say is credible, the person at Social Security can't say their pain is incredible. Mm. All of a sudden, well, everything you say is legitimate and has to be accepted. So you're doing it for two reasons. One, for the quality of your life, but two, because then Social Security has to accept whatever you're saying. I mm. always ask the therapist, is your patient credible? The mm. answer is always going to be yes, because if they're not credible, why are they getting this treatment? So they are credible. It this is, what this we need is to good, prove. Jim. This is really good. I hope you folks out there are getting this, right? Yeah. That is an amazing tip right there. Now, Social Security took away credibility as a requirement in a doctor's report. I still ask it because it's invaluable in my questionnaire in showing that everything my client is alleging is legitimate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's very nice. Now, in looking at the evidence, is there like a period of time that you would view to be the most uh, important? Like if you go back 12 months, 24 months, like what, what, what's the key time frame for evidence? That again, depends on the conditions. If mm -hmm. it's an injury, I'm usually going to get everything from the date of the injury forward. Mm-hmm. I, mm. I just, I have a hearing coming up for somebody who was injured in 2019, has mm. had multiple surgeries since then, and I'm getting everything. Mm. In reality, the judge isn't going to read everything. No, They say they will, but they won't. But in my memo, I will highlight what's important. And the judge knows me well enough that if I highlight certain things, it's all in the record. Yeah. Um, if it's an ongoing problem, let's say you have MS. MS was diagnosed in 2010, but you stopped working in 2022 or 2022. Mm -hmm. You don't need the records from 2010. You need the records going back. I like to get them a couple months before you stopped working. Mm -hmm. the only time I would make that a, make a difference on that is once in a while, there's some doctors who don't think you were diagnosed properly. In that instance, I like to get the whole thing and show six, eight, 10, 15 years of working up. Yep. Um, once in a while, and this isn't on the initial, but if you have to go as far as a hearing, I like it all to show to a judge, here's a person who was diagnosed in 2010, you can see that they continued to work for 11 years after the diagnosis, see how their income stayed the same for this long and it started dropping. They started missing time from work just to show that it's a person who made a maximum effort until they just couldn't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good point. Good point. So the last 12 months is the most important, but there are some situations where there's older injuries or surgeries where you would like to go back and grab some medical records, right? Right. right. Last okay. 12 months or from the onset of when you be stopped working. Okay. If you stopped working 20 months ago, I would get all 20 months. Okay. All right. Um, now, I know you encourage something that is uh, I want to dig into here is, is for a disability applicant to get their medical records as a strategy that you use. Let's talk about that for a minute. Uh, first of all, why, why, if Social Security, if the if it's on them to get the records at initial, why is it that you encourage people to also get the medical records? A lot of claims are denied because they didn't get the medical. Everybody making decisions in every, every state has time limits on how long they can have a claim. 
mm-hmm. a hospital or doctor doesn't send the records in in time, right. the claim's going to be denied. If you mm. get them, and now medical records are available online if they're kept electronically. Mm-hmm. Print mm-hmm. out all your, don't print out what they give you at the end of an appointment. Go in and get the actual office records, print them all out, or say, I want a copy of all of my office records. In many states, they're free. Mm-hmm. And if you say it's for a social security claim, they're free. Mm-hmm. Get those office records, submit them. They can't deny you because they didn't have the medical records then. Mm-hmm. Now they have them. Mm-hmm. What I like to do also is give a one page, sometimes a page and a half memo saying, here's the highlights of those. Yep. Dr. Smith on page 23 diagnosed my congestive heart failure. Mm-hmm. Whatever it is, give, give them some bullets of, of the high points of those medical records. Because if they're being evaluated based on how many cases a week they handle, mm-hmm. they're not going to read a thousand pages of medical records. They'd get fired for that. Right. Right. Okay. And so how uh, do you, if you will, coach your uh, people to get the medical records, they can print them. I expect they could also download them onto their computer, but what's the logistical process that you and encourage people to use to get them to social security, like hand deliver? Everybody has a barcode. Once your claim is filed, you get a barcode. Mm -hmm. If you fax them, it goes right into your file. You can Mm -hmm. fax for free at a library. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a fax at home, don't go to FedEx or to UPS and pay a lot of money to fax it. Go to a library and fax them for free. Yeah. When you fax them with that barcode, it goes right into your file. Yep. Or it's supposed to go right into your file. 90% of the time it actually does. Mm-hmm. And that way you know it's there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That way you also keep a copy for yourself. Don't get rid of those just because you fax them. Yep. Still keep yep. them. You may need them later. Okay, good. For those of you listening out there, if you want to go uh, and do it electronically from your computer, you can get a like Ring Central. You can get a subscription for fifteen, eighteen dollars a month, and you could attach a document to an email that is sent to a fax number that Social Security provides, and you could get the records into the file that way. Um, so. Uh, of course, you got to pay for it, but you either pay one way or another if you've got to go somewhere in fax, right? So, unless um, you go to the library, unless you go to the library, yeah, and there's free parking. Um, so that's good. So get the medical records to make sure that they have them, even if they are requesting them, right? Correct. The okay. Other well, they thing, will request them, right? When you're faxing, I'm going to jump ahead a little because I know you were going to talk about the activities of daily living form. I know. Yeah. You're, you, you're on to me. <laughs> Everybody gets an activities of daily living. Um, I had somebody on dialysis who got an ADL form activities of daily living form. He was going to get disability automatically because he's on dialysis. They still sent the form. This is a crucial form to fill out. Don't just check, bo- te- check boxes. Tongue twister. Mm-hmm. Give them details. This is one of the most important forms you fill out. And if when it says, do you make your breakfast? If you check yes, somebody making a decision is going to say, why can't this person be a cook in yeah. a diner? Breakfast mm-hmm. may be a cup, a cup of coffee and a Pop-Tart. Mm-hmm. Tell them what you make. I make toast and coffee, and then I sit down and rest for 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. When it asks if you do any housework. If you just check yes, they're going to say, well, why can't you be a housekeeper in a hotel? Don't just check boxes. Paint that picture. Make them not look at paper, but visualize who you are at home. Mm -hmm. I can vacuum for 15 minutes and then my back hurts so much I have to sit down and rest for 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. When it asks if you um, have, if you get along, if you get along poorly with others compared to before the disability, 
Mm -hmm. Almost everybody has cut down on their socializing. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of clients who say, I don't go to church because I can't sit in the pews anymore. I don't go out with my friends because it hurts too much to get in a car. I argue more with the people I live with. Mm -hmm. Whatever that is, don't check boxes, explain it, describe it, give them a lot of detail. The more they have to read, the more they picture everything you're going through every day. And the more they can see that you can't, first of all, go back to the job you were doing. And secondly, just living every day is a chore. Yes, I do laundry. I can, my spouse drags the laundry to the basement. I can put mm -hmm. it in the washing machine. And then I have a chair that I sit in for 25 minutes. And then I go upstairs. And when the laundry's done, I go downstairs. I put it in the dryer. And then I have to take a nap. Mm -hmm. If you take naps during the day, say so. Sometimes it's the medicine that makes you nap. Sometimes it's the pain. Sometimes it's just the fact that I don't want to deal with everything going on. So I'm going to close my eyes, mm. whatever mm. it is, tell them. Um, Jim, I have, I want to get a little more granular on this forms. And this question is uh, with uh, our mutual friend, Carl Osterhow in mind, going back to the pop tart and coffee for breakfast. Right. Yeah. If this individual is doing the coffee and the pop tart for breakfast, but is not able to do it every day, but doesn't include that communication of frequency, it is a point that I want to get some clarity on for the audience out there. So, how would you address that? I would put that I on a good day I make a cup of coffee and a pop tart three days a week i can't do that and the person i live with brings me a cup of coffee in the living yeah. room where i'm sitting in my chair yeah i will give you my most extreme case i had a client with severe autism he was living in a special needs home he was 20 years old the judge said what are they teaching you to do independently and he said they're teaching me to make breakfast the judge said, what do you make for breakfast? And he said, well, I'm learning to make cereal and milk. The judge said, can you do that? And he said, I get it right about half the time. This was one of the worst judges in the country who wrote that the claimant is capable of independently preparing his own meals. <laughs> we got 50% that percent of the time. <laughs> right. we, we get, and, and cereal and milk, not a real milk. Yeah, but yeah. we got that decision reversed. But the claimant said everything perfectly. Mm. Had he put that down, he didn't come to me until he had a hearing schedule. Had that been down on the initial application or on the form about daily living, it probably would have said, had them do a better evaluation and he would have received benefits without ever having to appeal. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Good tip. Um, I'd like to talk about credibility for a minute. Um, and I just was in a meeting this morning with an individual um, whose name I will leave anonymous, but 36 years you know, in a career as a pharmaceutical uh, rep, um, had multiple back surgeries and the demands of his job was he was out and needed to drive five to 700 miles uh, to go see the doctors, right? So he made, he's done very well. His social security check is the max and his wife's a teacher. So his question was, um, and this is just one part of the credibility thing. He says, what is, how will social security look at my credibility? Because I've been working and earning all this money. And now if I come to them and I'm looking for a check, will they look at it as good or bad? So that's, that's the first part. And then I want to get into like, what other credibility issues might, 
one want to take into consideration as they are looking at this process? I have always found that the higher your earnings, the more credible you are when you apply for disability. Mm. Why would somebody give up a great job to get disability that doesn't pay nearly what you were earning? Mm -hmm. Uh, One of my best examples, I had a case with the fastest judge in the country and he swore my client in as she was walking into the hearing room. (laughs) Um, Had her sit down and I was told never duplicate a question he's asked. Asked her what she was making. She said $84,000 a year. She was 28 years old. Went right to the vocational expert who described her past work. Went to the doctor he had there who described her impairment. Then said to the vocational expert, if I believe everything she said, there's no work she can do, is there? The vocational expert said, of course there isn't. And the hearing was over. The judge then said, Everybody should leave the room, but Mr. Brown. I left and he said, there's no way a 28-year-old woman earning $87,000 a year would give that up for disability. Right. Of course she should get it. <laughs> I, I'm, I live in Cleveland. The hearing was in Houston. I said, why'd you make me come all the way to Houston for this? <laughs> he said, in all honesty, it's because I didn't look at this case until this morning. Uh... Well, at least he's honest. At least he was honest about it. Yeah, yeah. But I went to Houston for an eight-minute hearing. Yeah, well. and um, But high earnings are good. On the other hand, low earnings on a credible claimant are also excellent. Mm -hmm. If you take somebody who dropped out of high school in 10th or 11th grade, who's only done heavy work, and they have some serious physical problems. Their credibility is superb also. You can't lift 15 pounds and all of your past work was lifting 100 pounds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've had people like that crying about it. Mm -hmm. To me, at the first time we talked, let alone when they talk to the Social Security people. Mm -hmm. If -hmm. you're a crier, let it out. It doesn't matter. Let them see how upset you are by what life has done to you. So if we look on the other side, we've talked about some good examples of credibility. Do you have any that are detrimental to a disability approval? Anybody who's not 100% honest. <clears throat> yeah. Even if you think it might hurt you, your honesty will help. Mm-hmm. And I've had some people who have said, no, I can't do anything around the house. Or my greatest example is the person who says, I can't lift anything. Mm-hmm. And somebody will say, well, are you walking around the house naked? You put some <laughs> clothes on, didn't you? So you're lifting something. And yeah. be honest. Don't exaggerate. Don't overplay anything. But if you give good, honest answers, whether you're talking to somebody at your local office, at the state office, or at a judge, give honest answers and your credibility is excellent. Um, If you're a crier, let it out. If you don't cry, don't force it. Uh, But the most, that that's issue number one. Number two Mm -hmm. is I've had people, I've got one now. He was a manager at an auto parts store. Very low IQ. And he wants to play up how important he was. And all he did was check stock. He had a list of all the stock in the store. And he walked along the shelves and checked to see if it was there. And he's trying to overplay his importance. He never opened a close, never hired or fired. They made him a manager because that way they didn't have to pay him overtime for the 55 hours a week he worked. Ugh. And I have to make this person understand that downplay the title. We want to talk about the job you did not your title. 
And he keeps saying, but I was a manager. I was the assistant manager. I say, but let's talk about what you did as it. So don't make yourself more glamorous. This is the time to be thoroughly honest about what you did in your job. When you say what you did more about the, uh, like how much did you have to lift? What was the amount of time that you had to stand? Right. Those types of things. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Good. Good tips. Um, There's going along in that and getting back to your doctor. If once the doctor said you're credible mm -hmm. um, and you have great medical source statements on your site that people can find. Mm -hmm. But I like to ask the doctors, whether it's an orthopedic surgeon, a psychologist, a primary care doc, um, how many days per month will this person be off work? If you're going to be off work two or more days per month, that's 24 days per year, Mm -hmm. you're unemployable. What's the threshold, Jim? Is Is that the baseline threshold? 24 days a year? Depends who's looking at it. Most of them will say one one or more days a month. Yeah. Because that's 12 days a year. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm comfortable with two. Mm-hmm. I'm okay with one. I get a lot that say four or more days a month. Mm-hmm. If there's some serious... If you're getting infusions, an infusion usually knocks you out for two days afterwards. Mm-hmm. So if you get a monthly infusion, that's three days a month, you're, un- you're unemployable because you, yeah. the day you get the infusion and two days afterwards. So you're at 36 days a year that you're going to be unable to work mm-hmm. just from that. Mm-hmm. Um, I like to ask what percentage of the day can a person be off task? If you're off task 10% of the day, They'll usually say you're an, you're employable in an unskilled job. If you're off task more than 10%, you're unemployable. Off task means okay. your, pa- your pain is so serious that you can't pay attention. You're up. Uh, if you're, you can't concentrate, you're taking too many breaks, anything like that, you're off task. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If you're off task 15%, for sure you're unemployable. Um, that would mean that more than an hour a day, you're not getting your work done. The other important question I like to ask is how many breaks per day will this person need? Other than scheduled breaks, you usually get a morning and afternoon. If somebody has to take three or more unscheduled breaks per day, they're unemployable. That is a crucial question. If you're taking three or more breaks per day, you're off task more than 10% of the time, Mm -hmm. Uh, depending on how long the breaks are. If the breaks are at least five to 10 minutes, you're missing a lot of your workday and you're unemployable. Mm -hmm. Those are crucial questions for the physician to answer. If the Mm -hmm. physician says you're credible and answers those questions properly, the case Mm -hmm. should be over. Mm -hmm. It isn't always over because depending on who's looking at it at your state agency or as the ALJ, you still sometimes have some convincing to do. Sometimes the judge just accepts that or the vocational person at the state agency accepts it and it's all Mm -hmm. done. Mm -hmm. So if somebody's listening to this out there, even especially if you're working still, this would be a good task to start journaling about like what is going on in your day-to-day work how much of the time consistent with uh attorney brown's example are you are you off task you know maybe you've got to take a nap in your car three times a week or for an extra 15 minutes beyond lunch something like that even right could going a step further if you're not working and you're at home how many mm-hmm. times between eight in the morning and five in the evening do you go to the bathroom? Mm-hmm. How many naps do you take a day? Mm-hmm. While you're at home, you can be journaling too and yep. show a contemporaneous log of what your days are like. 
Mm -hmm. which shows why you're unemployable. Okay. Very good. All right. I want to pivot a little bit in the time that we have so we can go through one more area of questioning, and then we're going to take some questions. So uh, for those of you that are listening out there, there is, if you're on YouTube or Facebook, you can enter. Oh my God, look at the questions. Um, you can enter a question into chat and we'll take as many as we can uh, with the time that we have uh, with Attorney Brown. But what I want to talk about in our last kind of segment here is the the cases like getting denied, starting with the physician's uh, perspective. Oftentimes, I hear from our members here that physicians are helpful and they'll provide information and the, the, then they find out that their their patient, our member gets denied and they don't they feel bad. So I mean, I don't know if you have anything to add to that or anything more that some of the key causes for denial. I've kind of got a big picture question here, but I'll open okay. it up that way. Sure. Um I'll start with an example from a Cleveland Clinic doctor that I was sitting next to at a meeting one day. Okay. And he said, I don't understand it. I say my patients are disabled and Social Security still turns them down. And I said to him, well, I just got a letter from you. And it said, I've been treating this person since 2014 and they became totally disabled on March 1st, 2022. I said, that's totally worthless. You didn't tell us what you treated them for, what you did, yeah. what your diagnosis was, what worked, what didn't work. I said, I know what a miserable person you are, and you wouldn't say somebody's disabled if they weren't. But <laughs> Social Security doesn't know that. And he said, you mean they really want all that information? I said, if you'd attached all of your office records, it might have helped, but I don't know your records for this patient yet because you haven't sent them. They have to go mm -hmm. through a different process at Cleveland Clinic to send them. So a lot of cases get turned down because the so-called helpful physician doesn't know what they should do. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Your medical source statements are a good start if the physician will fill them out. Mm -hmm. Physician records are important. Mm -hmm. In the 80s, if you have rheumatoid arthritis and certain blood tests, they you win automatically. They stopped mm -hmm. asking for lab work and then denied people because there was no po positive lab work. I spoke mm -hmm. to the Rheumatology Association and said, whether or not they ask for it, send all your lab work. And we greatly reduce the amount of people with arthritis getting turned down. Um, it, it's a matter of the physician should always send all of their office records. Mm -hmm. If they just send a report, they're invariably going to leave out something that's essential. Mm -hmm. So if they want to send a report or fill out the form, add their office records with it. So a few things that I am. Um hearing here, one that stands out is that a doctor could be supportive, but it not all doctors, I don't know if, if there's, a doctor's doctor, they don't truly understand the qualifications for disability. Would you agree with that? Totally. I spoke <laughs> at the American College of Urology because nobody was getting benefits who had something called interstitial cystitis. And mm -hmm. one of the questions was, but what you're saying isn't proper medically. And I said, social security medical is different than physician medical. And sometimes you just have to put it into social security's language. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, on that note, like uh, residual functional capacity reports, right? Um, I don't know if you use those in your practice. If you do, could you speak to them? and the value of, you know, how they could help somebody fill this gap with the communication from their doctor to social security. Well, that's what social security has changed the term to medical source statements, but yeah. same thing. You want to know how much can your patient lift? How long can they stand out of an eight hour day? Stoop, bend, reach, push, pull. And this is the same form where I ask how much will they be off task? Mm -hmm. How many days a month will they miss from work? But you're, you're putting all that, in, including their diagnosis, their medicines, uh, 
reactions to medicines. So, and that's what you have good forms on, on, on your website. Yeah. And they're specific to different conditions. So people mm-hmm. just need to get the right form, get it to their doctor. A lot of doctors will fill it out better when they're with you. Some doctors say, I can't fill out a residual functional capacity form. You have to send it to, you have to go get an examination by a physical therapist. The doctor doesn't need that. It doesn't have to be a science. It has to be the doctor saying to you, out of an eight hour day, how many hours could you spend standing? Mm -hmm. I, I had one person in Congress when they were talking about changing some of the rules who's tried standing for three straight hours in one place. And he called me up and he says, Jim, <laughs> I, after about 20 minutes, my hips hurt, my knees hurt, my back hurt. Yeah. He said, now I understand what you mean about why it's so difficult for somebody who's worked in a factory all day. Mm-hmm. I said, that's the point. You can't change the rules. You have to take it all into consideration. That's what you have to tell your doctor too. Mm. But sometimes just make an appointment and bring the form with you and say, doc, bring can them. you help me with this? Yeah. Can you help? This is my income. I'm not able to work. Yeah. Good right. point. Okay. Last few things. Um, what are some of the main reasons we talked of that uh, cases are denied? We talked about the medical records. We talked about the medical source statements, but what, what other possible you know, if you had to list like a top five, and those are two of them, what what might some of the others be? Well, are... not getting the records in on time is way up there on the list of reason cases get denied. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, what, here's something very important. Social Security often sends people out for a psychological consult. Sometimes even on a physical consult, mm-hmm. yeah. they'll say, well, you're doing this because you need the money, don't you? An innocuous question. Except if you say yes, then the doc writes, this person has compensation neurosis. That's not that they're really disabled. I tell people when the doctor asks that on the social security exam, don't answer, say something like, I just wish I felt better. No amount of money will take care of what's happened to my life. I just want to go back to work, but never say, yes, I need the money. You may be desperate for the money, but Mm -hmm. don't say yes, because that can fill up two paragraphs of their report and Mm -hmm. make them think anything you tell them that hurts, any depression you have is all phony. Oh, this is great. Change the answer. Never say yes to that. Just change it. I see so many claims denied because the consultative examiner says, Oh, this person has compensation neurosis. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, Good so one. That that's just a, a crucial one. Um, yep. Another reason, and it's totally beyond anybody's control, is claims are usually reviewed by a medical examiner at the state agency. That medical examiner is somebody who's retired, looking for a way of making money. In some states, those retired medical examiners are making almost a million dollars a year. They used to get paid by the hour, and then it got changed. Hourly employees are figured in the budget by making them get paid by the case they review. They're reviewing about four times as many cases in an hour, and it's quicker to deny than to, re- than to approve. So I want to make sure I get this. The state medical examiners are getting paid on a performance basis to review cases. More they review, more they make, and they're earning up to how much? In some states, it's almost a million dollars a year. Wow. In some states, it's not. Some states, some docs just do it as a sideline. But the ones who are doing it three, four days a week, I'm getting four or five an hour in one state, a doctor does eight an hour and nobody questions them. They just say they're helping with our backlog. Right. Right. And that's part of the, the feedback that we hear is that people 
oftentimes are rushed in and out of these um, these exams. Right. Now, so, so now these aren't the examining doctors. These nope. are the doctors that review the exams. Okay. Okay. So they're just sitting somewhere reviewing documents. Right. They're okay. sitting at home in their pajamas reviewing documents. Mm. Wow. Now, the, the other thing, Social Security won't send a claimant or their representative a copy of the consultative exam. Mm -hmm. They're supposed to send it to your physician if you request that they do. They usually forget to do that, too. I like to get that consultative exam and send it to the attending physician. It's so, great, it's great yeah. when the attending physician can see what some doctor who saw their patient once wrote about them. Mm. Mm -hmm. I think this doctor misdiagnosed, is treating the patient poorly. This doctor said the patient can only lift 10 pounds, and I think the patient can lift 50 pounds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can get some incredible responses from the attending physicians to the consultative examiner's case, uh, um, letters. I think you could call that stirring the pot. I love stirring, yes. <laughs> um, one of my greatest was, some, I was representing a dwarf who'd had three back surgeries and the doctor examined him, said he could lift 50 pounds. A small person can't lift 50 pounds with no back surgeries. Mm. Mm. And the orthopedic surgeon who had done this man's three back surgeries just went through the roof. He gave me about 750 pages of articles about mm. little people's impairments before they have surgery, um, just from skeletal problems. Mm. So I actually was able to get that examiner taken off the list of examiners for the state. You've done some good work. Good work. I try. Um, so listen, let's let's uh, pivot now. I know there's a lots and lots of questions out there. So uh, in the 20 minutes or so that we have remaining, we will go through as best we can. Um, so Jam, who does an amazing job at organizing this part of the program, uh, will find and read off uh, various questions and we'll have at it and see what we have for answers. Ready, Jim? Sure. I'm sorry, were you asking me, Brian? Yeah, we're, we're ready for some questions. Oh. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, before that, um, Sir Jim, I would just like to thank you for returning um, to join us once more today. It is truly an honor to have you here sharing your invaluable experiences and imparting your wisdom, not only to us, but also to all of our viewers out there. So thank it's you. It's a pleasure being here. Well said, Jim. All right. Um, I have a question here. <clears throat> How long is it taking to get a written decision from the ODAR office after receiving a fully favorable bench decision at the hearing from the ALJ? It has been four weeks since my hearing was held. Well, first of all, ODAR is now OHO, Office of Hearings Operations. And some judges get upset when you call it ODAR. But mm. it depends on the judge. It depends on the difficulty of the case. I have had some where I've gotten the decision in two weeks, and I've had some where it's taken nine months. Some judges routinely take nine months. The judge, mm. the good judges at the end of the hearing, except in the really obvious ones, will, after the hearing, go through the recording of the hearing, along with their notes, review the medical evidence, and then it, write a decision that's anywhere from five to 15 or 20 pages. The longest one I ever got was 37 pages. And they try and make it comprehensive, and then it gets mailed to you. It again depends on the judge. When I started, the judge's decision used to be one line pre-printed that said, we find the claimant is entitled to benefits beginning. The judge wrote in a date and signed it. 
And if they turned you down, it was one pre-printed line, the claimant is denied benefits and they signed it. And now they have to write a real opinion. Yeah, if they went back to that, it might speed up the process, huh? Right, but it would be difficult to appeal and difficult when Social Security likes to you should also know that your, the favorable decisions of the judge get reviewed by someone in Virginia. And about 5% of those either are reversed or sent back for a new hearing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good question. All right. All right. What's next, Jim? My son received SSDI December 2021. He is 57 years old. Judge says review is in three years. How likely will he get a CDR? At oh. age 57, it's unlikely. Um, the important thing is he should keep going to the doctor, keep a record of all his doctor's appointments because they're going to ask him, how often do you go to the doctor? What medicines do you take? What are your days like? So when he has bad days, he should make a note of the bad days too, so he can tell them that. All right. Hi from Missouri. My sister is in Montana and um, is still waiting for nearly two years. Her appeal should be coming up before a judge soon. Um, that was just a statement, sorry. Um, would SSDI investigator ask your doctor to send you to physical therapy without me knowing? No. A uh, follow-up question on that. Why would I get a, an overpayment? I filed a reconsideration form and one and 11, 11 months later, I got another overpayment for the same thing. I'd have to see the overpayment notice. If you're still working, um, it could be a mistake. If you won the overpayment, you should send a copy of that favorable decision to them and say, why are you sending me this? If there's been no change in your circumstances. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, who sends the paperwork to your doctors to fill out or can you print them out off yourself? Social Security doesn't send the RFC or medical source statements to your doctor. So you should print them off, bring them to your doctor and ask them to fill them out. All right. Um, my friend just got denied after a mental CE. How does my friend apply for reconsideration? Um, no, please understand that it's hard to get help from an attorney. Not everyone can get help from an attorney. Okay. Well, first of all, it can be an attorney or a non-attorney representative on Social Security claims. Um, secondly, you can go online to ssa.gov and file the appeal. Or depending where you live, you can find a, a representative to help you file the appeal and go from there. I have a thought on this one, Jim. For some, Sometimes people just don't have a case that's in a winnable shape right now. So if you meet with somebody and they say, nah, I, I don't want to invest or take your case. Ask them why and what it is that you could do to improve to get your case in a format, winnable format. Ultimately, you have to ask yourself, I mean, if you can't work, you can't work. Uh, it's worth fighting for. So um, that would be uh, one other thought on that. Let me expand on that, too. Make sure you get a second or a third opinion before you give up. And some of the large national firms that get a lot of leads or do a lot of advertising absolutely refuse to represent anybody under age 50. Mm -hmm. They're right. not helping a lot of people who need help. But also there's a lot of people who just need to find the right lawyer. Sometimes one lawyer says no or one representative says no. And it gets back to the best lesson I ever learned was my first bar association seminar I ever went to. And they said, the difference between being average and excellent is your creativity. And somebody, sometimes someone just needs to look at you a little differently and say, I can help you. Here's how we're going to do it. Don't give up yet. Good, good point. 
All right. Um, thank you for everything that you do. How do I prove I'm still disabled if I was approved for mental illness and I've been stable with medication for a while? Would Social Security consider me medi medically approved? That, again, is up to your physicians. Uh, how many how much would you be off task? The, the med medicine for mental illness often keeps you off task. It might keep you stable, but not stable enough to work. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a tough question to answer. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, how about 12 to 20 months from full retirement age? Wait four months or last day of work. Um, I believe this was when you mentioned waiting for a while before starting to apply. Okay, if you're 12 to 20 months from full retirement age, you're at what Social Security considers advanced age. Mm -hmm. I would still wait until you're off work three months to apply for disability. You can apply for early retirement, but if you apply for early retirement, your benefit is reduced forever unless you get disability. So if you don't need the the money right now, I would wait and just file for the disability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, is it a good idea to call or appear regarding being in limbo for weeks? Apply December of 22 and at 90% complete. Oh, this is a good one. So somebody's application is like stuck. Right. Okay. First of all, I've seen a lot of them that say 90% and then drop back to 60% and go up to 80 and then back to 70. Somebody decided to post that percentage for a reason that is way beyond me. And it makes no sense. Um, if you've been at 90% for more than three months and nothing's happening, you may want to leave a message and say, just say, when can I expect to get my decision? Mm -hmm. sometimes you just get lost in the social security cloud and sometimes somebody's really doing something or waiting for something. I've had times when it's a really good claims rep evaluating the claim and they think they can approve it. They just need one more something from your doctor and they've gotten an extension they've sent for it. And you make that call and they say, I'm just waiting for Dr. So-and-so to send me the pulmonary function test. You can go get it and fax it to them. Yeah. There's a lot of things you can do to speed it up if you find out what they're looking for. Good point. I was approved after my third brain surgery, which confirmed my left side paralysis was permanent. I was able to work after surgery one, number two. I was 59 years old when approved. Oh, sorry. That was um, a statement. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, understand what he is talking about. Um, I was within my career field for 23 years and was gone. And yes, I miss it and get depressed over it. So it's mm -hmm. just also a statement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All that right. again, get some therapy for that too. Yeah. Um, after my brain surgery, I got some cognitive therapy and it did wonders for helping me just compensate for some things that I needed it on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, here's another tip from a viewer regarding faxing your medical records, social security, your bank or insurance agent will also fax for free if you ask. At least mine do. Good. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. All right. Um, I have a hearing court on Friday, 922. Where can I access to the hearing court? Where, sorry, where can I have access? to the hearing court? Mm, I don't know if that's a telephone hearing, a video hearing, or an in-person hearing. If it's right. telephone, they will call you to start the hearing. You have to be in a room by yourself. If it's a video hearing, they'll send you a link like you got for this. And if it's an in-person hearing, they should have sent you an address to show up at. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. They need to go back to their notice of hearing and uh, find out which one of those it is. <clears throat> Something right. else that's important. A lot of the judges like to have the hearings take no more than 45 minutes. 
Sometimes you need more than 45 minutes. If the judge tries to cut you off and you're not done, just say, I'm not done. The hearing notice doesn't say this is a 45 minute hearing. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. if you have things you need to say or do, make sure they let you know or say, when can we have a supplemental hearing? Which annoys the judge a little bit, but it gives Mm -hmm. you a chance. Usually they'll say, just keep going. Mm -hmm. Good point. All right. I have diabetes and neuropathy and have fallen a few times due to low sugars. In fact, I hit the ground yesterday. What chances of getting disability? Oh, Jim, I can't wait for your take on this one. (laughs) Well, first of all, the person didn't tell us if they've stopped working or not. Um, Mm -hmm. If they're still working, they should keep working. If they can't work, they should, first of all, keep a calendar of they should journal their falls. They should probably have journaled their blood sugar levels. If they've mm-hmm. gone to the emergency room, they should take a um, keep track of all the ER visits, all their doctor visits. My guess is with this diabetes, there's also some hypertension. There may be some hearing or vision problems. I would speculate, and this is where I'm being the artist from head to toe, there's some migraines thrown in there. Um, if there's ever been any injuries from these falls, we want to document that. And what other problems does the person have? Uh, with diabetes, there can also be some internal organ problems. If that's never been checked, ask your endocrinologist to check all of that too. Another big problem I've seen for people with diabetes is they don't sleep well. And it's interesting, there are some good studies by sleep specialists that show that lack of sleep exacerbates diabetes. If you're not sleeping, you're also not as capable of working. Because if you don't get a good night's sleep, you're not going to be as coherent during the day. These are all things that you want to include in your application if you're going to file for disability. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Back to the, the original question, if all of this is documented, does your doctor know all of these falls? It should be in the doctor's records. If it's all there, the chances of getting disability are excellent. Well said. All right. Um, I just got turned down on my CART case. Uh, makes me mad because on my mental evaluation, he says that my bipolar isn't a disability because I can't spell and numbers backwards just because I can't spell it. Just um, just because I'm bipolar doesn't mean that I have to be retarded just to have bipolar. That's the dumbest thing I ever heard. Mm, can sense the frustration there. Yeah. Totally. Um, that again is where a good medical source statement from the psychologist to show how much you'd be off task, how many days a month you'd miss from work. Mm -hmm. You may have had one of those judges who just doesn't believe anybody. Mm -hmm. And if you had one of those, it's a problem. If Mm -hmm. you were represented at the hearing, ask your representative if they're appealing to the appeals council. When I have to appeal to the appeals council, I always ask my clients to go through the decision and make notes on anything they think is inaccurate in order for me to be able to take what my client says is inaccurate along with what I think is inaccurate and write my brief for the appeal. Yeah, good. Uh, Just uh, an observation in respect of time. Uh, Let's say we have time for two more questions, Jim, before we wrap up today. You know, Brian, maybe we should have a session where it's just all Q&A. Wouldn't that be yeah. something? Yeah. A flick of Definitely. open it up. Yeah. Send, send some in in advance and take the rest as they come along. All right. Love it. All right. Um, can you explain how often is a continuous review after age 53 in heart surgery for 90% blockage and five tumor surgeries? What to expect during reviews, how often they are? If I could answer that, if we have a shutdown, (laughs) the CDRs will slow down for a while, but the shutdown won't be forever. Um, 
you're supposed to be reviewed every three years. We can thank Congressman Jim Bunning for that. He told me once that nobody's disabled, they're just not motivated. And if they are disabled, God's punishing them so the government shouldn't give them any money. So that was one of my few times I was speechless when I was meeting with people in Congress. Mm. In any event, you're supposed to be reviewed every three years. Once you hit with those conditions, age 57, 58, the review should stop. What you should do is keep a log of every doctor's appointment you have. Every time your medicine gets changed, make a note of the new medicine and why you're taking it. And keep a log of your bad days. I woke up this morning and I felt so terrible. It took me an hour to get out of bed. My head hurt so bad I couldn't leave my couch for two hours in the afternoon. Whatever made it a bad day. My kids called and they aggravated me so much that I went back to bed for two hours. Anything that made it a bad day, write it down. And that way, when they review you, you're going to fill out their form. One of the forms questions is how often you go to the doctor. If you write once a month, it's not as good as listing date after date after date. Mm -hmm. If you take this notebook or print it out from your computer and you bring the log and say, here, attach this when you uh, send this to the person reviewing me. If you give them enough pages to read, they're not going to read it. They're, they ha Again, they're on quantity. In some states, they have to review 30 cases a week. If you give them 50, 60 pages to read, they're just going to say, I'm not bothering with that. I'll go on to the next person. Good point. Um, I know I'd said a limited amount, but uh, I do see one in here. I just want to, if I could sneak in one last one. Um, and this is, uh, the, the question is this, I have spondylosis, it's a listing, um, a spondylosis and spinal stenosis. Um, and I believe I meet a listing X, Y, Z. So these are common. You can swap it out. I've got a back injury. I think I meet the muscular skeletal. So the, the last question that I, I'd pose to you before we wrap up is if somebody has the condition I feel that oftentimes I get this like optimism that they meet a listing. Uh, what's, what's your take on that? How would you address that? A diagnosis is not a disability. A diagnosis tells you something's been diagnosed. To be disabled, it has to cause certain limitations. You can have stage four cancer and not be disabled if you're still working full time. Mm -hmm. You can have stage four cancer and not be disabled if it's not affecting your ability to function. It's going to, but it may not yet. Mm -hmm. The same with spondylosis. Mm -hmm. It's a listing if it affects your ability to lift, stand, stoop, push, pull, reach. If it's not affecting those to a serious enough level, then it's not disabling yet. Mm -hmm. So. That gets back to filling out the activities of daily living and to filling out your form. On mm -hmm. your application, it's asked for the diagnoses, but there's a place called remarks at the end. And you can put as much as you want about why this is disabling you. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. Well said. I uh, Hopefully that will eliminate some people having this false sense of social security, if you will, because they have a condition, right? Um, Absolutely. So, so wonderful. Listen, uh, I see 433 people out here on YouTube, Facebook. I don't know how many, but I thank you everybody for taking time to come out today to listen and join us and ask some great questions. I hope you found some value out of this. Um, Jim, thank you for taking Thank the you. time and, and, and your wealth of information, Jam and Philip also appreciate you guys being here. Um, just a heads up for next week. Um, we have a special guest Salah 
who is going to be participating with us from Newcastle, England. She does work for us here at the Disability Digest. She runs a business and she suffers from a chronic fatigue syndrome and she's built a beautiful business and what you will learn hopefully from her um, is her story of how to take a little bit of time and leverage it, make a difference and kind of get your your juice flowing, if you will, like the individual who is not working and sounds like you're kind of, you know, out of sorts because of it. So, so regardless whether you want to work or not, that's, I, I, I'm in hopes that you'll learn some nugget of information from uh, Salah next week. So, so Jim, I would like to take you up on your, on your offer for just a uh, open, mm-hmm. you know, let it roll question session. So, so that would be wonderful. We'll pick a date and we'll get it done. All right. Good, good. So thanks again, everybody. Stay tuned. We look forward to having you back again. Make it a great day. Bye now. Thank you guys.